Are you ready? <laughs> We're ready. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ken Herndon. I am the university archivist, and I'm an associate university librarian here at Queen's University. Uh, it's my great honor to welcome everyone to the 41st annual archives lecture to be delivered by Dr. Peter L. Tuig. I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. The annual archives lecture is an important event in the calendar of Queen's University. It's organized each year by the Queen's University Archives. The lecture series is meant to highlight the rich and extensive archival collections that are available at the university. And it's to serve as a public forum to disseminate and discuss the re research that is or has been carried out using those collections. So this physical space animated by this wampum bead inspired wall brings us together to converse and reflect on today's stimulating presentation. It also reminds us to begin these proceedings in the best way possible by offering grateful and respectful acknowledgement that Queen's University is situated on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee. This territory has significance for the indigenous peoples who lived and continue to live upon it and whose practices and spiritualities were tied to the land and continue to develop in relationship to the territory and the other inhabitants today. And land acknowledgements like this remind us of the history that precedes us, our shared responsibilities to be embraced, and the opportunities before us to walk together on a shared path of truth and reconciliation. So for those of you who don't know, the Uni uh, Queen's University Archives has a special two-fold uh, mandate it undertakes its activities to, in order to manage, preserve, conserve, and make accessible the information assets of the university, and to maintain an authentic record of the programs, people, and operations of the university. It has a second mandate to provide archival management and conservation for culturally significant records of external and, uh, organizations and individuals in support of teaching, research, and service at Queen's University. The first archival document was presented to the university in 1869, and today the archives houses approximately 10 kilometers of textual records, about 2 million photographs, tens of thousands of archival ar architectural drawings and plans, and thousands and thousands of sound recordings and moving images in many, many, many formats, legacy and current. The archives is privileged to hold the records of regionally, nationally, and internationally significant individuals and organizations from the entire range of scholarly disciplines and occupations, including the historical records of the city of Kingston and the county of Frontenac, which speaks to the enduring town and gown relationship between the university and the communities it serves. So I'd like to return, though, to the first part of the mandate for the archives, the responsibility for the university records of enduring value and the authentic record of our activities. And this mandate is rare among Canadian university archives. Often our peers are only responsible for private records from third parties. And we are fortunate to have a long and well-documented history here at Queen's. Um, the institutional record represents about 40% of our overall holdings. And unfortunately, private records are sometimes perceived by some people working in an institution as inherently, uh, uh, private records are sometimes perceived uh, as inherently more research worthy than um, the records of their institution. But of course, this is not so. Indeed, one of the takeaways I hope you will consider from tonight is the value of institutional records for research, scholarly dissemination, and teaching. And to borrow a concept from J.R.R. Tolkien, and my colleagues will now uh, groan because I am a huge Tolkien uh, aficionado. All archive materials have great applicability. Their many possible uses reside in the freedom and creativity of researchers, students, creatives, and community members. So before we go further, a little housekeeping. Could I ask everyone to put their phones on silent mode or turn them off if you haven't already and sort of feel that we're in this quiet bubble of archival bliss for the evening? I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge, and I checked before mine's off, uh, the work of, <laughs> so I'd like to, importantly, before we go any further, we, we had a lot of people help us with this, so I'd like to just uh, really acknowledge Lisa Gervais, Deirdre Bryden, Natasha Watt, Sean Badley, Jen Amos, Kim Dixon, Grant Jackson, Scott Woods, Emily Zhu, and Nancy Petrie to pull the event together and provide all the necessary digital, 
physical refreshment and financial supports. And I'd also like to acknowledge the, the general support we receive from across the library and archives uh, when it comes to this event. This lecture will be recorded and shared afterwards on the Queen's University Library's YouTube site. There will be a question and answer uh, session after the lecture facilitated by myself and my colleague Deirdre Bryden, the archivist for University Records. If you raise your hand, we will bring you a microphone so that everyone can hear the question. And after the Q&A, we'd like to invite you to stay and continue the conversation in a relaxed but exciting atmosphere with food and beverages. So let me now introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Peter L. Tuig. Peter is a social historian of Canada at St. Mary's University, specializing in the history of health and medicine. He is the author of more than 30 peer-reviewed articles in scholarly journals, such as the British Medical Journal, the American Journal of Bioethics, and the Canadian Historical Review. He is also the author of three books and edited five essay collections. He was elected to the Royal Society of Canada, College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists in 2014, and is a former president of the Canadian Society for the History of Medicine. He is currently the president of the Canadian Association for the History of Nursing. Notably, he spends as much time as possible conducting archival research. And Peter was also our 2021-22 Geraldine Grace a Marine Alvin McWaters Visiting Fellow at the Archives. And this fellowship is awarded annually and was generously established by Dr. Cheryl S. McWaters and her husband John McDermott, who are both Queen's alumni, and here with us tonight. And this, this is a great program because we're able to uh, foster, promote, and support original archival research by scholars, authors, or artists in the collections located at Queen's University Archives. So this helps us bring people to us to explore our exciting archival collections. And through this award, Peter was able to spend uh, four weeks with us in July and August 2022. So we're really quite excited to hear the results uh, stemming from that research. Today, Peter's lecture topic will be preparing for intelligent and thoughtful practice, university education and healthcare workers, 1965 to 19. Wait, did I change the date? Yes. 1965 to 1975. Uh, Peter, once again, welcome. The room is yours. Okay. I think that was it. That was a lovely introduction. I'm uh, so grateful to be here at Queen's, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak to you all. I was so honored to receive the Geraldine Grace and Maurice Alvin McWaters Fellowship in 2022 that allowed me to do this research. I'm so happy that Susan John are here, so thank you for being here. Um, it's really meaningful to me. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank Ken especially, but really all of the staff of the um, Queen's University Archives. Uh, I spent four weeks here. It was probably four of the most productive archival weeks I've ever had because of the helpfulness of um, everybody involved. Um, and that's really a good place to begin because as a historian of health and medicine, largely of the 20th century, you know, we don't face the challenge of having a dearth of material. We face the opposite challenge, that we have too much material to deal with. You know, we have the records generated from hospitals or voluntary organizations, patient and consumer groups, government records, and those generated by uh, education programs, including the records of the university. So the challenge that I've always faced is how do we find interesting analyses within these records? And my particular interest as a historian has always a little bit higher. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. It's here, here. It became disconnected. Let me see. Sorry. How's that? Better? Okay, sorry. Right. So as I said, the, the challenge is to find interesting analyses within these records. And my particular uh, goal as a historian has always been to try to find ways to connect the history of health and medicine, which sometimes can be parochial, 
with the work of other historians. So, so that's always been my, my interest. The University Archives also have a special place in my research. Um, I've written two books largely out of materials housed in University Archives about healthcare work, and a third that I hope will be published shortly. Um, in the past year, I've worked at seven different University Archives across Canada and a couple in the United States. And I'm always looking for ways of uh, finding um, connections between Canada's universities um, and the other important questions facing our country. So in the often routine and certainly voluminous records of the university, there are incredible stories. My wonderful colleague, Jackie Duffin, who is right there, um, you know, one of my most important mentors uh, throughout my career, of course, many of you know, former Hannah Chair here at Queen's University, um, you know, a force of nature. What else can you say about her? Um, but Jackie recently wrote uh, an award-winning book based in part uh, on records that she found at the University of British Columbia archives. And um, those records connected um, uh, Canadian researchers to Rapa Nui, to Easter Island, and to a larger story of organ transplantation. I, is that pretty good? Not bad, eh? Um, and I think that really speaks to the potential of university records to tell interesting stories. So I'm grateful um, that Jackie's here and that I can highlight her award-winning work, which just received the Jason Hanna Medal from the Royal Society of Canada for the best work in the history of medicine. And I think, you may correct me, it's at least the second time that you've won the medal. The third, I thought. <laughs> I, I was hedging my bets, Jackie. I was hedging my bets. The third time that she has won that medal. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so today I want to focus on knowledge claims using records about occupational therapy at Queen's and in Kingston. And this is an area of scholarship that's been slow to emerge in our considerations of healthcare workers. I also see in the university archives abundant evidence of the ways that universities and their local communities are not two solitudes, something that Ken addressed in his opening comments, but are deeply connected. So I want to explore some of this. I'm probably not going to get to 1975, which is why Ken had to look at the title slide to see whether or not I had adjusted. I'm probably not going to get there, but I, I am going to draw on the research that I conducted um, here at Queen's. So let me turn to the heart of my presentation. So Kingston was an important center for occupational therapy education in the mid 20th century, even before there was a program at Queen's. There were two earlier initiatives in the community that attempted to address the profound shortage of healthcare workers in Canada. The reasons for these shortages were complex and included the implementation of hospital insurance, changing employment patterns for women, changes to nursing education, worker mobility from province to province or outside of the country, and a whole host of other factors. Inadequate staffing levels had an impact on working conditions and directly um, affected the availability and quality of care. So the shortage of workers also affected the expansion of health services making it difficult to meet the changing needs of Canadians in areas such as mental health services or rehabilitation services for people with disabilities. So occupational therapists were all trained in universities in Canada. The University of Toronto launched its program in 1926, and it was the only program in Canada until 1950. McGill and University of Montreal uh, uh, established their programs in 1950 and 1954, respectively, and other programs followed in the 1960s. But the number of occupational therapists graduating from universities could not keep pace with the demand for workers. And let me illustrate this with just one, I think, striking example. 
when Manitoba was faced with a severe polio epidemic in 1953, the shortage of physical and occupational therapists was so profound that the province actually had to recruit 20 workers from England and fly them in to provide basic care for people experiencing polio in that province. All across Canada, there was strong demand for occupational therapists, but the supply from university programs simply could not keep pace. So in 1953, there were fewer than 300 occupational therapists in Canada. And this only increased to 500, just over 500 by 1961. That year, there were 367 vacant positions across Canada. When the Royal Commission on Health Services reported in the mid-1960s, the famous Hall Commission, it found a vacancy rate for occupational therapy of about 24%. So almost a quarter of the positions were unfilled. And this meant that people who needed OT services were simply not getting them. And that's not a small point. You know, when there are shortages of healthcare workers, people delay seeking care. care. They don't get the care they need, or they get less than optimal care. So the profound shortage of OTs prompted a number of different responses. The federal health grant program allowed existing programs to expand and supported the creation of new ones. Canada also turned to internationally educated physicians and nurses. Healthcare work was also reorganized to assign some tasks to new categories of workers, and new training programs were created to support the, uh, the, the um, training of those workers. So Kingston's first foray into occupational therapy education was actually a program to train occupational therapy assistants. And here the idea was, at first blush, straightforward. Using federal and provincial funds, a training program would be created here in Kingston at the Ontario Hospital. And this, in theory, would free occupational therapists from doing routine tasks and allow the university-prepared OTs to do other things. Nursing was engaged in a similar project in these same years, creating an intermediary group of credentialed nursing assistants who would come to be the quote-unquote helping hands to our ends, taking on many of those tasks. I've written extensively about these nursing uh, assistants. They became crucial for meeting the need for nursing labor in the 1950s and 1960s when the supply of our ends just simply could not keep pace. So nursing assistants, those predecessors to today's licensed practical nurses, and these occupational therapy assistants are really best viewed as part of the reorganization of healthcare work that's taking place across Canada at mid-century. So the OTA program begins in Kingston in 1953, and the original course focused on preparing staff for work in mental health hospitals and was 12 weeks long. The shortage of OTs was particularly acute in Ontario's mental health facilities, known collectively as the Ontario Hospitals. Students were drawn from existing staff across those hospitals, and a handful came from other provinces. From the outset, it was thought that OTAs would be closely supervised by fully qualified occupational therapists, but the reality was far from different. In many settings, OTAs were the only staff providing occupational therapy services. So they were critically important because they allowed for the expansion of services in a period when there were no OTs. In fact, although 30 of the 33 mental health hospitals in Ontario offered some form of occupational therapy, only 17 of them actually employed occupational therapists. The rest used a variety of craft workers, tradespeople, or existing psychiatric staff to provide what were 
nominally occupational therapy services. In December of 1960, Ethel Smith, the executive director of the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapy, reported that a half dozen hospital superintendents had contacted her to discuss the problem of staff shortages and the resultant diminishing of OT services and efficiency. So at the end of 1961, Smith highlighted that as hospitals began to develop activity programs, they could not secure qualified OTs. And as a result, there was an influx of sub-professional personnel, her phrase, not mine, and other workers who possessed skills in specific areas like art therapists, music therapists, recreational therapists, and others. The shortage was felt most acutely in psychiatric settings, which were terrible places to work. I mean, we know they were terrible for the people who resided in those institutions, but they were equally terrible for the staff, and we shouldn't forget that. And employers in those facilities had been forced to resort to the employment of many persons from a variety of skill areas. The time has come when we must relate the role of the occupational therapist to the total activity program, wrote Smith. So professional occupational therapy argued that these kinds of services ought to be the purview of occupational therapists alone. Smith wrote that these other workers were hired when OTs were not available. She raised some questions. Does the specialist now infringe on occupational therapist's use of these skills? Or how do we integrate the roles of the occupational therapist and the specialist? Even if OTAs were an imperfect solution, they at least help to inscribe these services as the purview of occupational therapy as a profession. So employing OTAs was better than the alternative and in a way created a bulwark against other kinds of workers intruding into occupational therapy's domain. The OTA program here in Kingston ran for 18 years. It helped to establish Kingston, Kingston as an important setting for OT education and it set the stage for the emergence of the next program, which was the special course. Now, the special course was an intensive 18-month program to educate fully qualified occupational therapists. It was launched by the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapy in 1959 as an independent program. So it existed outside of the university. Now, this was an extraordinary response to the shortage of occupational therapists. It was partially funded through the National Health Grant Program, and they received their grant in May of 1959. However, the CAOT was still responsible for many of the costs, including the rental of the space, the general administration for the program, all of these things. But despite these costs, which were significant, a burden on the CAOT, the school was considered to be of prime importance to the profession. So the plan for this school came together very quickly. The program was launched in September of 1959, and just a few months before, in July of that year, Muriel Driver was appointed the director of the school, and this proved to be a critical decision. A d dynamic leader, Driver ensured the program's success, and as we will see, she would be instrumental in shaping the Queen's program. The school operated out of 47 Queen's Crescent, not too far from here. 11 students initially enrolled, um, including six from Ontario, two from British Columbia, and one each from Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and New Brunswick. Driver highlighted that the class included nine men, and uh, sorry, nine women and two men. And the second cohort looked pretty much the same with people coming from other Canadian provinces, including Nova Scotia and Quebec. So although the special course was independent of Queen's, the university was critical to its success. 
providing teaching expertise in several different areas. Driver acknowledged the contributions of Dr. Bruce Young, who was the director of the Frontenac and District uh, Rehabilitation Center. Equally important was the contribution of the OT departments in Kingston's hospitals, Hotel Du and the Kingston General Hospital. And the staff in those departments, quote, gave very generously of their time and interest, end quote, to provide the students with practical experience. Driver added that in spite of staff shortages, the therapists in these departments have been able to provide two placements for each of the 11 students. So this relationship between the clinical um, training sites and the program would come to be important, and we'll see why in a few moments. A few years later, though, Driver acknowledged what she described as the tangible interdependency that existed between educators and clinical personnel, and argued that it was a point that bears reiteration upon reiteration, and again, picking up on this link between the university and the community. With the low enrollments, the funding for the school remained precarious at best. The original grant money expired in, 19, in June of 1962, and a renewal was only submitted in November that year, and the CAOT actually went to its members to raise money to keep the school going. But it was, cl it was clear that if the school was going to continue, there had to be more students. For Ethel Smith, it was a challenge for the CAOT to meet its share of the financial burden operating the school, and this meant that thoughtful consideration had to be given to the future of the school. Although the program continued to face funding challenges, it was a modest success. The executive director of CAOT noted that 38 of the 39 original graduates were still in practice. That was an achievement. The special course was also viewed as rigorous. Driver acknowledged that the program was intense and was neither ideal nor comfortable for the students or the staff. But the students brought specific strengths to the program because they all had to have a prior educational experience. That's what made the school unique. Everybody that entered the school was either an RN a teacher or held some other university degree. So this was, uh, uh, this was part of their intake. Students who had been RNs, quote, bring with them patient-oriented attitudes, concepts of rehabilitation, and an understanding of the hospital atmosphere. Those who were teachers had both community and school experience, knew how to deal with problem children, and exhibited a, quote, keen desire for special training in the management of the problems of childhood. Older students, people with degrees, brought their experience to the classroom, while younger students injected um, a refreshing note of gaiety and high idealism to the learning environment. So in 1965, the CAOT looked at what was happening in education programs for occupational therapists, the seven schools operating across Canada, and it found that the special course in Kingston required the highest number of classroom hours and the highest number of clinical hours. So it was a rigorous, rigorous program. Clearly the students had abilities that made them well suited for careers in occupational therapy. By 1967, the school graduated 59 individuals, and 54 of those remained in practice. Again, this was no small achievement given the shortage of occupational therapists in the 1960s and the high rates of attrition within the profession. One thing that I'd like to point out is that the program also graduated 15 men. I don't know much about these men, but I would note that this is significantly different from what we see in other university programs where there were virtually no men. Driver described the special course as an example of educational experimentalism. She concluded that it is possible to educate mature students 
in the relatively short time of 18 months if they were well prepared and carefully screened. And although unacknowledged, it also appears that, at least for some men, having a faster path to OT work was also appealing. So there's probably more work to be done. Maybe Jenna, one of your students, can pick this up and uh, learn more about those men. But the course, the special course, was never intended to last forever. And it was simply a response to an immediate demand for occupational therapists. In February of 1967, the board of directors of the CAOT decided to discontinue the special course. Although Driver had directed it from, the, from its inception, and she knew it was making an important contribution to meeting the immediate need for staff, it was less than ideal. It was undersubscribed, it was costly to operate, it relied on the goodwill of Queen's University faculty members, and most importantly, it was situated outside of the university. The course was always considered to be a temporary measure. So in 1963, a brief was submitted to Queen's that clearly stated that the special course would be discontinued if and when Queen's created its own OT program. So although there was some regret about closing the course, key individuals were already hard at work creating an OT program at Queen's. That's the last part of my story. So in 1965, Muriel Driver was busy developing a proposal to create a school of rehabilitation medicine, which would include an OT program. The submission clearly built on the initiative of the special course, but the goal here was to create a four-year degree program with appropriate clinical training opportunities in the local hospitals. This would ensure that students would obtain the necessary skills to be prepared for practice, but also a rigorous and deep academic background. Driver was interested in more than simply meeting the demand for workers. She emphasized that the objective of occupational therapy education was to, quote, properly prepare students for intelligent and thoughtful practice. But what did this mean? We can find a clue in the original groundwork that the committee did to establish the School of Rehabilitation Medicine. So Dr. J.V. Banagian wrote to fellow committee members that there was support for the initiative within the faculty, but that they, quote, had to fashion a tightly thought out curriculum and general program which will be acceptable to both the faculty and to the university senate, end quote. They did just that, and they developed the full proposal uh, over the next several weeks. The program would educate various paramedical personnel, including speech therapists, medical social workers, physiotherapists, and occupational therapists, and they would all earn a BSc in rehabilitation medicine. So from the outset, this is viewed as a degree program. And degree programs were aligned with where occupational therapy saw itself going. A few years before, there were editorials uh, about, um, about degree programs in the Canadian Journal of Occupational Therapy advocating that they needed to have these programs to attract the quote-unquote more highly endowed students who were going to other careers in this period. So Driver did not believe that existing OT programs adequately prepared students for the reality of working in a rapidly changing hospital environment. For her, the shift to degrees, quote, springs from the rapid gain in scientific knowledge in these fields and increasing professional responsibility of the therapist for the selection and supervision of therapy upon the prescription of a physician, end quote. So this view was clearly incorporated into the supporting documents. The shift to degrees was also linked in part to the reorganization of occupational therapy labor 
that allowed some of the routine work of the therapist to be assigned to other workers, including the OTAs that I described earlier. Existing programs provided students with a high degree of technical competence. Driver wanted to ensure that undergraduate OT education linked skill-based training to the leading academic knowledge from the biomedical sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. This would provide a richer education for students, according to Driver, and would enrich the profession by ensuring that OT students could move on to graduate education and become professional leaders and researchers. Education reformers argued that while it is possible to teach these skills in a way that allowed them to be applied generally, um, this was only part of OT education. As Driver and others emphasized, the key was to apply these skills to the needs of individual patients, to think through and consider the various options available and to discuss the alternatives with other members of the clinical team, including physicians. So this required more than technical acumen, but also necessitated that OTs begin to learn the skills of clinical thinking and clinical judgment. In the submission, it's noted that OT is carried on most effectively as a one-on-one -on -one relationship between the therapist and the patient. The doctor and the therapist herself does not know the best way to reach a certain goal and will often try several different and occasionally opposite methods in order to attain success." End quote. While other occupations are able to take precise orders from physicians and carry them out, OTs had to exercise clinical judgment. And any prescription for treatment from a physician was often changed on the spot, according to Driver. In other words, OTs had to exercise that elusive quality called clinical judgment. The document explicitly acknowledged that because of this, students in occupational therapists benefited from the rigors of a university education. And that each program, quote, should be of such standard that the student can go on to a master's or doctorate without having to catch up on improperly designed courses. The graduate of such a course should be able to step directly into a teaching post or to continue on in research or other academic activities, end quote. In other words, the program offered should be degree caliber rather than trade school caliber. Now, among the professional leaders in occupational therapy, there was a strong desire to phase out diploma programs, which still existed in some Canadian universities, in favor of four-year degrees. However, there were questions about whether this would be successful. Physiotherapy, for example, had a, a high rate of attrition. In fact, 65% of graduates left physiotherapy by the fifth year following their graduation. So there were concerns that by elongating the training period, it would have a detrimental impact on uh, occupational therapy. So they settled on a compromise to design a program that would allow students to exit with a diploma after three years, but to have an option to continue to study and complete a four-year degree. The Senate min minutes are finally at the institutional records. <laughs> Actually, it's all been institutional records. <laughs> I'll just be more explicit now. But the Senate minutes from February of 1967 contain a brief um, to Dean E.H. Botterill that was prepared by David Symington and the advisory committee. It made a strong case for a degree program. The brief reiterated the significant vacancy rate that had been reported by the Royal Commission and that the shortage of occupational therapists was likely to grow um, by the early 1970s. Most important for my purposes today is that this brief to the dean 
acknowledged that while the shortage of therapists is severe, an even more critical problem is the lack of teachers, researchers, and competent administrators. These must come from a profession whose ranks are depleted and where the basic training does not equip them for graduate studies. The solution is the immediate expansion of every possible facility for training undergraduates. Clearly, what was being advanced by the proponents of the program, of the program at Queen's was an education that was to be transformative, that would establish OT and the other rehabilitative sciences as academic disciplines. Now, nursing historians have recently taken up questions of clinical thinking and clinical reasoning. And some of the first forays into this area have been done by scholars like Pat D'Antonio and Dominique Tobel. But I think this remains an underdeveloped aspect of the history of healthcare work in Canada. And certainly, you know, looking at university programs is not something that a lot of people seem to be doing these days. Dominique Tobel recently wrote that the, quote, increasing complexity of patient care was becoming, uh, sorry, the increasing complexity of patient care also created the need for better educated professional nurses. But it's not really that cases were becoming more complex, but rather that the complexity of their care needs was being recognized, as was the need to engage in um, other providers in care. So this is the period in which team-based care is starting to emerge as a significant force in many settings across Canada. But it is certainly true, as Julie Fairman and Joan Lina have argued, that patient care was very dynamic in these years. So to establish OT as an academic discipline, professional leaders needed to build a community of skilled academicians and their own body of knowledge. And this would only develop over time. But in the interim, there was a lot of interest in incorporating and integrating perspectives from the social sciences into the still forming science of occupational therapy. Academic work that focused on the psychological, cultural, and social dimensions of occupational therapy were integrated too. So professional leaders were really engaged in an epistemological project to build up the academic mission of occupational therapy. So there were both practical and political reasons for situating occupational therapy within the university and developing degrees. In a practical sense, this would ensure that OTs were prepared to meet the demands of their clients and were ready to work as part of a clinical team. Politically, Advancing the profession in, in the context of a university would help give OTs academic legitimacy and a place at the table when it came to the future planning of health services in Canada. So Jonathan Harwood has described this shift towards science and research as part of the process of what he calls academization. Part of this involves a shift away from skills intended for practice only toward an orientation that integrates clinical skills and academic knowledge. So occupational therapy, which of course has a very strong practical orientation, was vulnerable to incursions from other groups like those art therapists, those musical therapists, and those other groups of individuals. So the best defense against this was to initially integrate those skills with a body of knowledge that was drawn from the biomedical sciences, hence the close relationship with academic medicine for 60 years, but also to begin to include perspectives from the social sciences and humanities that place the client at the center of their own story. So the process of academization can create divisions between frontline practitioners and those interested in this academic project. And this is often expressed 
in terms of the balance between theory and practice or between the science and art. We hear it about medicine, we hear it about nursing. But, and this was certainly apparent in um, occupational therapy during the 1960s and 1970s. And I wrote, uh, actually partly based on the work that I did here at the Queen's University Archives, I wrote an early uh, essay that looks at um, the relationship between universities and an effort to create a college-based occupational therapy program in Hamilton. I am one slide behind somehow. There we go. All caught up. Although Driver clearly uh, valued the idea of a degree, she further recognized that the development of the Queen's program was taking place in a moment when occupational therapy still faced a profound shortage of qualified practitioners. So she, she thought that the length of the program could be reduced to three years and initially be launched as a diploma program if students could remain an additional year and earn their degrees if they wanted. So Driver thought that this would have to be carefully planned so that the additional year, she says here, um, did not merely slap on degree credits but truly added to the basic concept of integrated education and thorough professional preparation. Driver recognized that most universities were moving away from diploma programs and that any proposal built around diplomas could be criticized by what she called university authorities. And I just want to step out of this for one second to say Many years ago, uh, Lynn Kirkwood, who's another wonderful scholar of Queen's University, longtime faculty member in um, the School of Nursing here, she did an interview with Electa McLennan, who was the first uh, director of the Dalhousie University School of Nursing. And in that uh, interview that um, uh, McLennan did with Lynn Kirkwood, uh, McLennan tells this story about uh, having a discussion with a senior arts faculty member who told her that there would be no cooking and no plumbing at Dalhousie University, meaning there would be no home act, no engineering, nothing like that, right? This was a very kind of traditional view of the university, but it, it really does speak to the skepticism that existed, especially in arts departments, towards uh, professions that were largely populated by women. So I think Driver is aware and of course sensitive to this um, as she is building her own proposal. So the initial proposal was uh, discussed at a committee meeting on the 5th of May 1965. Many changes were suggested. The proposal was refined. And then in September of 1966, the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, E.H. Botterill, charged the committee with bringing a proposal um, quickly that could be considered by Senate and that would allow for the implementation of a full-scale occupational therapy program in September of 1967. Symington wrote to Botterill that the committee decided it would take a stepwise approach, that it would have a three-year option and a four-year degree would eventually be implemented. The initial target enrollment was only 50 students divided between occupational therapy and physiotherapy. The Faculty of Medicine presented at the final proposal to the University Senate in February of 1967. And in presenting the plan, the dean, uh, Dean Botterill, noted that the diploma qualified OTs for work, so there would be no barrier there. But he also highlighted that there would be that pathway for students to earn a degree, noting that there was a shortage of trained people in these fields and a critical lack of teachers, research workers, and competent administrators. So again, this language of building the profession from within to ensure that it was well positioned for the future. So the dean moved the creation of the School of Rehabilitation Medicine, the motion passed, the first students would be admitted in the fall of 1967. Within months, Symington requested that the name of the school be changed to the School of Rehabilitation Therapy to recognize its multidisciplinary nature. 
So Muriel Driver was appointed the senior teacher in occupational therapy, and Jean Burton, another leader in occupational therapy, joined her. Both had been instructors in that special course that I mentioned earlier. The first six months were exceptionally busy for these women as the program found its footing within the university and in local hospitals. There were delays in terms of space, offices, classrooms, and laboratories, nothing that people that work at a university haven't experienced, I'm sure. Um, but the program did get underway. Driver maintained her appointment at Kingston General Hospital. And this dual appointment between Queen's and the hospital was thought to be unique in Canada. But it was uh, purposeful um, because they hoped that, dri that this would allow Driver to coordinate clinical and academic aspects of the program. But this meant that Driver was stretched pretty thin, uh, responsible for directing OT services at Kingston General Hospital, arranging meaningful placements for OT students and for teaching. And given all of this, the OT program probably wisely decided that it needed another teaching position. And those were the days when teaching positions could just be added. The OT program, the OT program began with only three students, two others quickly transferred in. And although the initial numbers were modest, the university was receiving lots of inquiries. By June of 1968, the numbers were pretty solid. 19 students were admitted, and other applications were still in process. And there were similarly strong admissions um, over the next couple of years. But even though applications for the programs were strong, they simply could not find enough clinical placements for the students in the local community. And so when Queen's was ready to inaugurate its four-year degree program, they actually put in an enrollment cap of only 18 students. Right? Of course, these small enrollments really couldn't solve the challenge of the shortage of OTs. And writing in 1968 in the Canadian Journal of Occupational Therapy, Margaret Trow provocatively wrote that if universities are unable to accommodate more students, then we must look to other sources for training. Trow suggested that the CAOT, quote, do not want to close the door on the possibility of training occupational therapists in the community colleges. She added that the CAOT was confident that the community colleges would meet and comply with the education standards. Well, Ontario had created its Colleges of Arts, uh, Applied Arts and Technology in 1965. This was part of the reshaping of post-secondary education across Canada in the 1960s. And although the government of Ontario made a sharp distinction between CAATs and universities, it was interested in exploring whether or not healthcare workers could be trained in colleges and could be trained more quickly. For example, the Healing Arts Committee, which undertook a major review of healthcare in the late 1960s, recommended that a pilot project be established for occupational therapy situated in an underserviced area. So could a college program be created to supply OTs in an area that was underserviced? In 1967, Thelma Cardwell foreshadowed the coming storm when she argued that, quote, in our efforts to produce more therapists, we must not be pressured into foregoing quality for quantity. Our standards must not be lowered. After all, as the example of OT at Queen's illustrates, they had worked carefully to develop a rationale for why OT needed to be in the university. And these arguments would be repurposed during the 1970s when the CAOT and the Ontario Society of Occupational Therapy actively resisted a college pathway for occupational therapists. All right, I'm at my conclusion. I, I, am I on time? I'm good? Okay. I lost track. I lost track. <laughs> Honestly, I lost track about two minutes in. Okay. <laughs> That's what happens. Okay, in an essay published in 1968, Muriel Driver noted how common it was for OTs to have to define their role and their work. She also suggested that the next era must be the era of research. Driver understood that universities alone 
offered the possibility that occupational therapy would be transformed into an academic discipline. Critical to this process was the creation of a distinct body of knowledge that would allow OTs to exercise clinical thinking and clinical judgment. OTs had to assist individuals in a consistent and orderly way. They had to make decisions about treatment, discuss findings with other members of the healthcare team, identify an individual's goals and interests, and formulate an appropriate treatment path. The absence of generic treatment plans that could be universally applied created that space for occupational therapists to engage in that clinical thinking. And this should not be viewed, in my, in my opinion, as an exclusively professional project that was solely about status and ambition, though these were certainly important. The desire to develop a knowledge base situated in the university was a genuine reflection of the growing complexity of their clients and the healthcare delivery system. OTs were keenly interested in trying to develop effective treatment plans in new areas, such as the rehabilitation medicine that was taking hold across Canada. Queen's launched at a time when OT education was being actively debated. The debate reveals two different perspectives on educating healthcare workers. On the one hand, there was the very real need to meet the demand for staff. College education, it was argued, could prepare workers more quickly and probably in a more cost-effective manner, but for OTs, this was simply not the only consideration. The development of the Queen's program, and the records of the university reveal this, show that the OT leaders were concerned not just with the immediate labor needs, but also with developing skilled university teachers, clinical leaders in hospitals, and a community of researchers. Cultivating this cadre of experts would ensure that OTs would be able to fully participate in the increasingly team-based environment of the hospital and that OTs would be able to shape the future of health services through the policy process in government or in healthcare institutions. In other words, professional leaders such as Miro Driver fully recognized that university education could help to transform occupational therapy and secure a future for OTs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for that wonderful presentation. Deirdre and I are going to deploy on either side of the room. And if people have questions, if you could raise your hand, we'll bring the mic to you. Um, thank you for that talk. I wondered if you had a chance to talk to any of the students who were in these programs in the early years of, of the period that you covered, and what sort of response did you get? I, I have not done oral histories with those students. I have read their biographies extensively, though, and I followed um, the students in terms of where they went on uh, in terms of their career. And, one of the most interesting things that I've seen so far, I mean, it's still early days in this new area of research uh, for me, uh, but one of the most interesting things is the um, fulfillment of driver's hope that these individuals would play a key role both as clinical leaders, but especially on the policy side. So we start to see occupational therapists who, you know, have um, uh, a certain amount of privilege because of the background of occupational therapists in this period, but I start to see a lot more occupational therapists at the table when it comes to shaping decision making about um, services for children with disabilities, 
in workers' compensation hospitals. I see a lot of drivers' influence in those settings. So I, my sense is, although I haven't done the interviews, my sense is that the student fulfilled her hope and the promise of university education. Thank you, Peter, for that talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I have a question about attrition because it came up a lot yeah. that it has this really high attrition rate and that a huge percentage were, were done after five years. And then we were also talking about the gender, right, and the fact that it's a primarily female field. Was there a sense that a four-year degree would be, I don't know, too much investment, too much time investment and monetary investment? Um, or was there a sense that if people invested more time and money, they might work for a longer period of time? Like, how did that attrition conversation, like, how was it gendered? Was it because people were getting married or having children? Did you have a sense of that? Um, and then how did that play into sort of the discussions uh, that were happening at Queen's? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a great question and it's a huge issue. It's a huge issue that um, occupational therapists across the country are sensitive about. It's why they want to hold on to diplomas. So um, several Canadian universities had diploma programs well into the 1970s. And in part, this was that intermediary step, right, to allow people to acquire the necessary education to practice. The attrition rate is extraordinary in occupational therapy. Um, I cut this part out because it's just so much detail um, and it would have bored, bored you all. But honestly, you see attrition rates of up to 80% after five years. It is extraordinary the attrition rate in occupational therapy. And I would also argue that there's a class basis to that. That many, uh, I mean, occupational therapy, this is from the words of occupational therapists themselves, was um, considered to be the debutante's course. The de this is from uh, the words of occupational therapists themselves, the debutante's course, which tells you that you know, the class position of the women entering occupational therapy. There's a wonderful oral history at, at the QUA, um, which is an, um, uh, an occupational therapist who trained in the immediate aftermath of the uh, First World War. And it's a wonderful, wonder, it's a, on an audio cassette, so Ken was talking about legacy media. It's on an audio cassette, but I listened to it when I was here. And you can hear in her voice, hear in her voice the kind of class position of occupation. So the expectation for many occupational therapists was that they would go to school, they would get an education, they would work for a very short period of time, they would get married and have children. Now, of course, many of the women, you know, made different choices. And over time, we see more and more women staying in careers for a long time. Um, you know, women like Isabel Robinson, Muriel Driver, some of these leaders in occupational therapy remained unmarried for their whole lives, right? Um, in some cases, they had relationships with, with the same-sex relationship. Um, in other cases, they just, you know, I don't have any evidence that suggests one way or the other, but I know that they remained unmarried. But the attrition rate is extraordinary. Thank you. That's really interesting. And it's interesting that it's going into the 70s when obviously all these patterns are changing in terms mm -hmm. of how long women are working. So they hit it almost right at the right time that a degree would then lead to a lifetime of work potentially. And they're also really mindful that of positioning occupational therapy as an attractive option when women's options are expanding. Right? And so they are really interested in how they can try to draw women in. And at times, they don't quite get to a, a kind of feminist interpretation of occupational therapy, but it does, you see hints of that, that this is a woman's environment, right? A largely woman's environment, and that there would be strengths in that, right? And you can start to see them kind of working the edges of that argument to try to attract people. They never go full on with a feminist argument. Some nursing programs do. Uh, occupational therapy hedges its bet, and I would also probably argue there's a class basis to that too. I'd probably argue there's a class based almost everything, but you know, that's <laughs> me. <laughs> I'm showing my cards now. Yeah. Th thank you, Peter, for a really wonderful lecture. It's restorative to hear somebody mining an archive so well, it makes me want to go right over there and dig in. Um, 
Uh, you talked about context and very eff effectively that this was the decade of the Canada Health Act. We had a baby boom uh, and medical science was really picking up the pace. I might just suggest there was another context here closer to home. The 1960s was a traumatic decade for the Queen's medical faculty. It began with talk of even shutting it down. There was an external account uh, report saying that it was conservative out of pace, uh, th there was problems with the, the way the staff was paid, etc. Um, the solution to this, as you know, was bringing in a, a Toronto neurosurgeon, Harry Botterill, who was quite out of the culture of Queens. Mm -hmm. He was an iconoclast, he was impatient, his nickname was Harry the Horse. Harry the Horse. <laughs> wasn't popular with either his faculty or the university, but he got things done and saved the faculty. And I'm, I'm seeing that what you've told us fits into that pattern of, of making the faculty relevant. One other example, I believe it's in 1968, the family medicine uh, is, is introduced to the program and that too is reaching out to the, the population. So I'm, I'm suspecting here that Harry the Horse was kind of a hero of this thing. Um, uh, he surfaces in it and he takes it to Senate. So I'd be interested in that. I think you're absolutely right that that context of what's happening in in Queen's medicine is is part of this story. It's part of this story. You know, there are years when Queen's does not receive a sufficient number of medical school applications to fill all its spaces. That's how bad things were. Can you imagine that a, a medical school does not receive enough application? But that's how fragile things were at Queen's in the late 50s and early 1960s. So that's a huge piece of the puzzle here. Botterill, clearly a force of nature, who is willing to bring in talented faculty members, and David Symington would be one of those talented faculty members. You know, somebody who was a leader in rehabilitation medicine, who could partner with the rehabilitation, the Frontenac Rehabilitation Hospital, but could build relationships with uh, Hotel Du and, and Kingston General Hospital. You know, this is all, there's a lot of moving pieces here, and the other element is the desire at Queen's to build, to build an academic health center. And this is also something that I see in the records of Queen's University in this period. I don't, we have histories of um, academic, I don't want anybody to think we don't have those histories, but I don't think we have histories yet of why they mattered for many of the disciplines within health services. So, you know, they're often written from the position of medicine and that's, you know, in some ways appropriate. But these sites become really important for nursing, occupational therapy, physical therapy, all, all of those other health professions and really create this desire for team-based thinking. So that's also happening here in Kingston in that period. And there's starts and stops in terms of how it will happen, whether it will happen. But there, the records of Senate, the records of the Faculty of Medicine are littered with discussions about the need for an academic health sciences center controlled in part by the university to consolidate all of the good work of Harry Bottle. It's really interesting. So much bigger story. That's why I'm at the early days of my research. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering if you found similar records in other archives or was this kind of like a unique find for you? Now, I have to sort of put this in context. Uh, I used to think I was a rabbit when it came to research, but I realized I'm really a tortoise. So I've, wor I've been working in and around occupational therapy for almost 20 years, right? So I started doing a small project um, at Dalhousie University to kind of bring together the history of the Atlantic region occupational therapy. And then I turned my attention to a variety of these um, assistants that were working across Canada and the Occupational Therapy Assistant Program. What's unique here is that the story does need to be understood in those three parts. That the assistants, the special course, 
and the university program, there are strong linkages and connections. So that makes Kingston interesting and different from other places. Some of the other discussions about the need for an academic mission, you see them uh, appearing at UBC. I was just at the UBC archives this past summer. Um, I see that, but they're drawing on Driver. Like, it's her vision, right? She, I mean, not to make a pun of it, but she's the driver <laughs> of this, right? Like, like it's it, in a lot of ways, she's the one that is framing the significance of this. And I, I, I just wrote a paper, it's in Historical Studies and Education, about what they try to do in Hamilton. Um, so they do create a college-based program at Mohawk, uh, which is one of the uh, colleges established um, in the 1960s. Uh, they, try to create, they try to establish it in the early 1970s, and it is bitterly opposed by professional occupational therapists, supported by occupational therapists in the community, but bitterly opposed by the organization. And what arguments do the, do the CAOT and the OSOT use? All the driver's arguments. They use all of these arguments to oppose the creation of a college-based program at Mohawk. They succeed in delaying the program by almost a decade. Wow. Ten years. They, they push it off, they push it off. They, the only reason that program launched was because McMaster comes in along and supports it. And now all of a sudden, it seems like it's kind of maybe a university program, but it's really not, right? And again, it's all these arguments about the need for academic leaders, the need for clinical experts, that there is more here than just training, you know, people to fulfill roles in hospitals. There's a bigger mission here. These are all driver's arguments. These are all things she was saying in the 1960s. So I find that's the unique part of the story. But it, I think it's a great story. And I think, you know, there are other parts of the story, like the clinical training linkages and other things, that make the university story part of the Kingston story and part of Eastern Ontario's story. So I think there's more to be done here. But I think this is, you know, a modest beginning. Well, thank you, Peter, and thank you for the shout out at the beginning. But uh, more importantly, thank you for recognizing the archivists here, who are fantastic mm -hmm. and uh, make working in our archives a, a real joy and productive. Um, I have a couple questions. I might have misheard you, but it seems that the Canadian Association for Occupational Therapists was kind of on the hook for funding the programs. A special course. Yes, yes, way back. Yes. Are there a lot of parallels where professional associations have to, it, it's kind of an apprenticeship thing, and there's no other parallel for that, that you're the, the expert on these kinds of things. <laughs> That's nice of you to say. Um, but I don't think <laughs> no, I No, you really are. Um, but no, I, I haven't found a parallel. You know, where a professional society, recognizing that there is a crisis in yeah. their profession, steps up to the plate and says, we're going to create a school, right? And they lease space. They advertise the program in all kinds of journals across Canada, Canadian labor, healthcare journals. And they are financially responsible for a significant portion of the cost. And they do get a federal health grant. And they do have the support of the Ontario Health Ministry and the Federal Ministry of Health. But the CAOT is putting a lot of money, but they are also putting a lot of time into the school. Having people, you know, come and teach. Um, they're building the relationship with the Ontario hospitals to ensure that the students are, and they're trying to recruit people mm -hmm. in. This is, I, as far as I know, an unprecedented response to really what was a crisis in all kinds of healthcare, you know, it, workers across Canada. It seems. Uh uh, so against what professional medical associations do because they practice professional birth control. Mm, yes, they, do. <laughs> yes, they, do. they don't want to expand their numbers all that much, right? right? Um, so th one other question, sure. if you'll allow me. Uh, Driver, you mentioned that she went to the United States. I'm, I'm curious where she went. We, we have a, a great friend in Kingston who trained at Hopkins in uh, occupational therapy, Beth Robinson. Mm -hmm. And... Um, she uh, she was at Hopkins and came back uh, 
with zeal for occupational therapy in Canada, and you may have spoken with her or read her stuff. Um, but drivers' arguments might be American. Is that possible? I, I think there's, um, so let me tell you about drivers. So of course, she, University of Toronto grad, right? right. Um, we won't hold that against her. Um, <laughs> establishes the first occupational therapy program at Runnymede Hospital, yeah. right? Then goes to Warm Springs, Georgia. And mm -hmm. just the name of it sounds oh, so right. inviting, right? But <laughs> in central Georgia, uh, quite near Macon, Georgia. Right. And she's there for a couple of years um, until she is recruited back to run the special course. That's, that's what brings her back to Canada. But by this time, she, she, she's elected president of the Georgia Association for oh. Occupational Therapy. I mean, you know. Um, she, she really was a driver. <laughs> she, I, I, you know, she's just one of those women that, you know, I've met a lot in my historical work. You know, these formidable, intelligent women that can get things done. And Muriel Driver is clearly one of these women. Wow. Now, occupational therapy in the United States is quite different from occupational therapy in Canada. So it's not conducted in universities. In fact, at one point, the Canadian Association of Occupational Therapy in the 1940s wants to tear up its recipro um, uh, reciprocity agreement with the United States because the quality of training in the United States is so far behind, <laughs> this is again, exactly. what's happening in the University of Toronto or the quality of occupational therapy right. in Canada. So a lot of those schools in the 40s, 50s are private schools. They are not really mm, robust schools and certainly not in universities. That only begins to change in the later 1950s. So I don't think the ideas are American, but I do think they're influenced by what Driver saw so, in America, right. that she recognized that giving people technical skills, you know, allowing them to learn the crafts of things like weaving or leather making, mm -hmm. all of those things, if you really wanted to create a profession that was going to um, meet the needs of its clients. So I think it was that that influenced her vision. Right. Yeah. So it was the opposite of American. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I think it was rooted in her experience of the fragmentary nature of uh, America's uh, uh, training. And I, you know, there are probably lessons there in nursing too. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Those are great questions. Perhaps we could uh, entertain in one more question from someone. And if, oh, sick. Thank you. Thank you. So, so interesting. And it's um, making me think back to the Ontario Hospital. There was one in my hometown and it had quite an impact and many people work there and residents uh, were very visible many of them and you know so and then of course things changed and I, and I was just thinking as you talked to about the tremendous needs that there must have been post-world war you mentioned that one oral history too because I was thinking of the tremendous needs that must have been there and um, just it's kind of um, horrifying, actually. I'm feeling this kind of horror about how few people there were that were actually trained in this way and, and the value of it. And just wondering, I, I don't have a fully formed question, but just sort of thinking about the context and where things went with the Ontario Hospital and whether what kind of support and employment prospects there were and in interconnections with what was going on in the educational sector related to that because of just such a need. Yeah, I mean, that's partly what drew me to the story of the occupational therapy assistance initially. I, I ran across an article that was by Jim Lederman, um, I think from 1960, I'm doing this off the top of my head, so don't quote me, although I'm, no. um, but I think it was from 1969. And he's writing about the Smith Falls, Ontario Hospital. And, you know, he's talking about the miles of corridor at that facility and the waiting lists for children to be able to access some of the services and care that they needed. And I started to think about the impact of that 
right? What it means when you cannot get the services that you need. And it's not just, you know, big institutions like the Ontario hospitals. This is also a period in which um, occupational therapists and various rehabilitative medical scientists are starting to get to, um, you know, what were called old age homes in places like British Columbia, long-term care facilities and other places. You know, there's a lot of opportunity for these workers to find meaningful employment. And unfortunately, the Ontario Hospitals was not a place that attracted a lot of interest. These were very difficult places to work. And I, I've written a little bit about this already. Um, you know, when you are already a profession that is down a couple hundred members, when workers have a high degree of mobility because they can go anywhere to work, you know, when wages are an issue, because the Ontario hospitals were not paying competitive wages, or British Columbia's wages go up, so you know you get the exodus of healthcare workers from Ontario to BC in the 19, uh, later 1940s and early 1950s. Some of them come back because then things flip again, right? But all of this has that impact on the quality of care, the availability of care, um, all of those kinds of things. And I just couldn't get this picture out of my mind that we have 33 institutions across the province of Ontario, all of which need staff. And, you know, the story, you know, we hear a lot about the deinstitutionalization of psychiatric facilities in the 1960s and the early 1970s. That's a story that needs to be told, of course, but it's not the whole story, right? We need to understand something about the physicians, the nurses, the other healthcare workers who remain in those institutions doing that very hard work of providing care. You know, it's one of the things I think a lo about a lot, um, you know, because of the experience of COVID and what happened in long-term care, and I've written about this too, right? Just the experience of watching workers, you know, uh, crumble under the burden of the pandemic, not because they're not skilled, but because they can't keep up and they don't have the emotional, uh, the ability to deal with the emotional burden of their work any longer. And I, I don't have evidence for this, and I'm being somewhat speculative. And I don't like doing that as a historian, but I can't imagine that this isn't an issue in the Ontario hospitals. You know, it's a huge issue. And a lot of mm, undertrained people are in these roles, and there's no shortage of scandals in um, mental health facilities across Canada. Nova Scotia, Ontario, where people receiving um, suboptimal care, people are being restrained because there's no staff. You know, one of the most beautiful stories I have of OTAs is, you know, here in Kingston, where the OTAs um, were able to be hired and they were able to take some of the residents on outings. And this seems like a, such a small, incidental thing, but if you could take 20 people off a ward, to allow them to go to a park or to a movie, right? Just to treat them with dignity, right? And to have those little experiences. I mean, those OTAs were doing this work um, in a meaningful way. And I think we need to recognize that contribution. So, you know, part of my, you know, my colleagues know this, but, you know, part of my work as a historian has been to try to tell more of these kinds of stories to broaden you know, our perspective of healthcare workers and, and to try to imagine, you know, a history of health and medicine that includes more than just physicians and nurses. And that's not to disparage physician, the work about physicians and nurses. Of course, it's critical. It's critical to what I do too. But we need to understand all of this too. And part of, me, part of my work is that intervention. I just, that stimulates something. Uh, we live in a world of PTSD acceptance, uh, wellness, even here on the campus, et cetera. Was there not a wall of kind of public stigma around this? Uh, in the, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Um, you know that Smith Falls Hospital you referred to on the streets of Smith Falls until shamefully recently is referred to as the University of Newfoundland. Right. Um, <clears throat> did this, was this an impediment in, in everything you're talking about? 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly a challenge. It was a challenge. The, the, the medical directors recognized that the stigma attached to working in these settings was a detriment to recruiting staff. You know, in a, in a period where staff had options, you know, one of the, you know, Muriel Driver would write about how many hospitals were adding occupational therapy services, right? This is a period of expansion of rehab medicine, of OT services in hospitals. So if you could go to work in a brand spanking new hospital in British Columbia, or you could go to work at Smith Falls, what are you going to do, right? Professionally, uh, personally, could go to work in, in one of these other settings and perhaps feel a little bit better at the end of the day. Whereas leaving some of these other facilities, I don't think people felt good at the end of the day. And in fact, a lot, some of the new work that I've been doing, not connected to this, but is around some of those uh, early efforts on worksite wellness, thinking about the burden that these workers are experiencing and how we were not really well positioned to deal with some of that from the perspectives of working people. So, you know, these are challenging, challenging environments. But it was certainly an impediment. I'm known for long answers to simple questions, too. Sorry. Should have warned you. <laughs> they're, they're wonderfully informative. I think um, uh, we should probably give our speaker a bit of a break and maybe give ourselves a chance for, for refreshment. So I'm going to ask my colleague, Deirdre, now to give thanks uh, to our speaker and uh, wrap things up. Hi, everyone. I'm Deirdre Bryden, um, Archivist of University Record. Uh, one of the joys of being an archivist is seeing all the ways that people use the records in our collection and it's always surprising and they always find stuff that we didn't actually maybe know we had and we certainly learn every single day that's one of the many joys of doing getting to do what we do and Queen's University Archives is one of the richest collections um, in the area and we're super fortunate to work here and we're really grateful to you, Peter, for coming all the way back to Kingston uh, to, to share with us your research. I wasn't here. I was on sabbatical last year, which is very ironic because it's institutional record. I was super excited he was coming, and I wasn't here. Um, so I, this was a, a pleasure for me to get to hear what you have discovered in our record. And I'm lucky. I get to go to dinner with them, so I get to hear what happened. I feel like we were kind of like, all right, what happened next? So I'll, I'll tell some of you what happened next. Okay, so thank you again, Peter. It was wonderful. Thanks.